G'day, Elliot Ritchie here from XYZ Company. I just wanted to see if now's a good time for a quick chat. Awesome! Look, I, I just wanted to know if you're still in the stock market placing any trades. Okay. And ha how are you going with your performance? Yep, that's pretty much consensus. Look, I just wanted to make you aware that I'm currently running a trading strategy here at XYZ Company. And basically, I just alert my customers of when a trading opportunity appears with the buy and sell price when we plan to take profit. And I just send out an SMS alert just allowing you to see if you want to take part in that trade. If you're keen, you just send back a yes and basically I, I place the trade for you straight into your account. Would you be okay if I sent you through some of my trading results and some information on how you can open an account? Excellent. All right, we'll stay in touch. Thanks very much. Talk to you soon. Bye. That was my day every day for a year as a stockbroker. Cold calling people and they weren't even people that were probably dead cold. These were people that had lost money in the market previously. So they were definitely not wanting to talk to me being a stockbroker. Today I'm going to walk you guys through what my life was like in this 12 month period as a stockbroker in Melbourne for a, a company that I can't disclose the name of and it no longer exists. And possibly from my experience, you'll understand why. This is not an indication of the stockbroking industry as a whole. It's just a personal experience of what I encountered when I worked for this company and the people that worked there as well. So take that as a grain of salt. Um, I'm no not indicating that stockbroking is bad in any way and this was from a period of time about eight years ago in 2012 that I was a stockbroker and it's it's probably no indication of what the the reality is today and what it's like in bigger firms but I'll walk you through that. The reason I did this video was just to give you guys a bit of background as to where I come from and my experience in the financial industry and just to really show you that I'm serious about what I do and I love what I do and I just want to give that back to you guys. How did I get into stockbroking? Well, it had been a passion of mine for so many years before I even started considering being a stockbroker. I was doing it all on my own as, like, as most people kind of start off doing and I had heard from a friend of a friend that he was making $40,000 Australian a month being a stockbroker. I thought, wow, that sounds amazing. And at the time I was working freelance and I thought, you know what, maybe I'll give this a go. Try something different and open up my horizons. So what I did, I started emailing stockbroking companies saying, look, I have no idea where to, where to start. I'd love, love some information. How can I become a stockbroker or maybe even work for you guys? And the company that a friend of a friend worked for, he, he got back to me. And he basically said, look, you know, I'm happy for you to become a stockbroker. Uh, let's, let's utilize your expertise as a web developer. If you design me two websites, I will basically pay for your education to get the certifica certification to be a stockbroker. And then you can pick wherever you want to move to in Australia, one of our offices, and just start working. Oh, like, this is fantastic. Okay. So I threw together a couple of designs for this gentleman and before you know it, I'm enrolled to this course. It's a three month course that went through in financials. It's an RG146 qualification. And basically I did that in six weeks. I went to Sydney for a day, completed the exam and just passed. Yep, I hit the exact requirement to pass and I think it was 75% at the time and passed it. So that was awesome. Next thing you know, I'm on a flight to Melbourne looking for a place to stay. I ended up just outside of the main city in a place called Maidstone. I'm paying $250 a week for a furnished apartment with three other people. Okay, so at this point in time, I have no idea what to expect. I have no idea what my tasks are. I have just this basic idea that I'll be utilizing my design skills and web development skills to basically market to people, trading ideas and other opportunities within the stock market. Wasn't quite the reality though. 
On my first day, I walk into this office. It's stunning. Beautiful views of the city. You're, you're up high across the city skyline. You see everything. You're looking through the city. You've got the park down the right-hand side. You're in the Twin Towers of Melbourne on Burke Street. It's sensational. I felt like I was where I needed to be at that time and place. As I walk in through the main entrance, I see a massive screen playing Bloomberg on loop. 24-7, they didn't turn it off. And I basically had a conversation with my boss there and he was very friendly and basically introduced me to the team and, and said, you know, are you aware of what you'll be required to do? And I said, well, not really. I'll be utilizing my design skills, you know, marketing, I guess, to, to gain customers. And he said, okay, are you any good with cold calling? I said, well, look, I'm prepared to do anything. You know, I want, I want this job to work for me. Um, I'll, I'll do whatever it takes, absolutely. And for that 12 months, I, I, did, I did give it my all and I, I did cold call and it was, it was challenging, but I pushed through. We'll get more into that a bit, bit later on. I'd like to just go over kind of like the day-to-day -day roles and things that I was expected to do. Uh, every morning we had a meeting and I, from memory, I think we had this meeting about 9.30. We had it with the other officers and they basically just talked about the market and things that were happening and everyone would probably take turns in saying, you know, here's a good trade idea, have a look at this company. And th that was the only thing we really needed to do all day. The rest was just cowboy country. You could just do whatever you wanted. And a lot of people did. A lot of people did do exactly whatever they wanted. There was a gentleman who would play solitaire for probably... 19 days of the month where he would do one day of work. He was running a covered calls options strategy and he just had uh, a financial advisor's clients and he would simply run these covered calls options every month and he would be walking around with 10 grand clear. Easy. Another guy, he would watch TV shows as he was watching the stock market. Being the Australian stock market, it was a lot less volatile in, in those days and he just had lots of time on his hands, waiting for the market to do whatever he wanted to do. And another gentleman, he was lucky enough to be given uh, a whole heap of clients that were from uh, a trade alert company. They basically looked for trading opportunities and they would just send out SMSs to their customers and this gentleman at my work, he would just need to place the trades. That's all he had to do. Placing trades, he had no risk or any anything to worry about in terms of his customers making money because they weren't his his clients they were this other groups and they were releasing the trades so all he had to do was place the trades which is quite easy and he was taking home a massive pay packet every month crazy now everything seemed okay when i first started but i soon realized that it was a very narcissistic environment where everyone took care of themselves it was dog eat dog and many people would team up with each other and they would create these alliances where people would sometimes take on role of just trading or just finding clients and work together as a team that way. Because when you're working by yourself, you kind of have to juggle all those things all at once, which can be quite hard because you have to try and get clients, but you're also trying to watch the markets and look for opportunities as well. It can be quite challenging. Stock breaking movies really show the world what these toxic environments look like full of sex and money and drugs. And it wasn't really like that in the environment that I worked at. Uh, it was certainly not a lot of big parties and girls everywhere or anything like that. Everyone really did keep to themselves and it was a matter of, I, the market's closed, I'm going home. Everyone just did their own thing and kept to themselves in their own little bubbles. Uh, there was one guy who uh, I caught doing something quite interesting. He was playing chess whilst watching porn at work, two seats away from the boss, on a Friday afternoon. Just the balls on this guy. Unbelievable. Everyone really did whatever they wanted. They didn't have to report anything. They didn't really have to show anything because at the end of the day, your performance on how much money you could generate for the company reflected your ultimate pay packet. Now, the pay packet worked like this. If you, when you first start, 
you were given a salary of about $3,000 a month. And that was probably before tax. Not a lot of money to live on, but it's something to start with. Which in most sales positions, that's pretty lucky to get. And the way that you would generate income would be through commission, through clients by placing trades on the platform. And this was done about $30 per trade, in and out. It was quite expensive. For you to make more than that $3,000 a month, you needed to generate at least $6,000 in commission just to break even. And if you don't have many clients, that's extremely hard to do and be successful trading. You're generating commission for the business, which means you need to enter and exit trades on a regular basis. And if you're successfully trading for clients on the Australian stock market, that's really hard to do to make quick turnarounds in these trades. And the mentality of the people that worked there was the pretty much churn and burn, pump and dump. They weren't too concerned about the client's well-being in terms of how much money they made. Um, it just meant that they lasted longer if they, they managed to make a profit for them. They certainly weren't trying to make them lose money. I mean, everyone, no one goes into this business to try and lose clusters money, but it just kind of comes off that way when they don't really care. Everyone wants to make profit at the end of the day, and it's where you work with the client to, to showcase this, that, that it works best. And now one of the one of the gentlemen, he was he was really borderline with how he treated his customers. He would lie and manipulate them over the phone and lie about figures and profits and things like that. It was so bad, he was discretionary trading, which means he didn't have authority to take the trade for his client. He wouldn't tell them about it. And this was because his strategy had gone so bad that the clients were losing money. And to try and win back that money, he would then enter a losing position again to try and catch it on the way back up, but it would never really work. This guy obviously got let go, but he probably should have done some jail time for the stuff that he was doing. It was very borderline. Uh, he was very successful and made a lot of money, but his clients lost a whole heap. And it just broke my heart to see that such a toxic environment that allowed them to continue to treat their customers that way. And this was what ultimately led me to to throw in the towel as a stockbroker was the toxic environment, the, the way that people treated their customers. And it, it just felt like just not a place for me to be in. It, it wasn't making me happy. No one that worked there was happy. Even the ones that made a lot of money, they, they despised the company. They despised their co-workers. It was, just was an awful place. And now that was... Once again, that was just purely my experience as a stockbroker in this particular boutique stockbroking firm. And that's probably why they're not around today. I mean, if you're, if you're trading for your customers, you need to have their best intentions in mind. And that, that can be hard when you're generating um, commission-based structure where every trade is generating new income and making your customers lose out. Uh, the only way I can kind of see that this works is through like hedge funds where the hedge fund manager gets a percentage of the profits, you know, so it's a group kind of commitment thing. My day to day was very different from most of the people because they had clients. They had either achieved this by staying around in the company long enough to get given customers from staff that had left or they had basically acquired them somehow either through marketing or other means. So they were all good to go. Whereas I, I was the only person that was really cold calling every day from a list of people that had already lost money in the market. And I struggled, I absolutely struggled to find customers that I could relate to and help generate some income for. Uh, but you just, you just gotta push through and it was really hard doing stock broking. So anyone that has a job where you're calling and talking to customers on a phone all day, you have massive respect for me because it is such a challenging job and it really makes you aware of what you're saying and how switched on you are. And not only this, people were at work, working nine to five jobs and here I was calling them up during their work day, 
to talk to them about stocks. And you would be shocked to see how many people that actually give me the time of day to talk about this kind of stuff whilst they're at work. Ultimately, I ended the stockbroking role and I've been doing my own thing since. I was quite scared of the markets after working in this, this company. I ultimately pulled all my money out of my super account and created a self-managed super fund and I was in cash for a couple of years after this uh, situation occurred. Uh, but that's that's just the way it is. I'm, I'm obviously trading again. I'm back in the markets and listening to my own own voice and doing my own research into the stocks that I trade and I have a lot more confidence in what I do. I don't have anyone else taking control of my money. In summary, take control of your own money. That's all I can say. Learn the skills that make you fluent in what you're trading and what you want to do with your money. Have your money work for you. Try not to put it in someone else's hands. But if you do need to put it on someone else's hands, make sure you're aware of what is happening, how they are looking after your money, what fees you're incurring, and especially monitor it. You need to know that your money is actually creating a return for you, and not costing you money. So become aware is probably my biggest takeaway. Just monitor your money more if you can manage it yourself. That's all I can say. So thank you guys for sticking around for another video. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you want to see a lot more of this kind of stuff, let me know down in the comments. Please subscribe. It would mean the world to me. Thank you very much for listening. If you are curious about what I've got going on in the background here, it's a platform called Weeble. Highly recommend it. I will go into that in a different video though, and we can fully explore the platform and what you can achieve with it. Thank you all. I will see you on the next video. Bye.